Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Our speaker comes to us this morning from Laguna Beach, California. Nicole Boyce is the founder of Global Genes and since 2008 has pursued the goal of helping families affected by rare disease connect with tools, resources, and much needed support helping to eliminate the challenges of rare disease. Since its inception, Global Genes has affected hundreds of thousands of patients worldwide. Boyce was personally touched by rare disease through friends whose son struggled to find a diagnosis for two and a half years. Once he was diagnosed, his family learned that there were neither treatments nor cures for their son's disease. She understands the importance of finding a diagnosis and has built an organization to help address this problem. Nicole has numerous consulting, sales, and marketing executive roles in her 25 years of experience. She has worked with world-class organizations in media, pharmaceutical, and high-tech sectors, including Shearing Plow, CMP Media, United Business Media, and Burrell & Company. A graduate of the University of California, San Diego, Boyce is a proud wife, mother of two children, including a Notre Dame student, and adopted mother of two dogs. In all of her spare time, she has become a hot yoga junkie, still hits the gym at ungodly hours, and still thinks she can take down most, if not all, of the young volleyballers at Main Beach in Laguna. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome home to Notre Dame, Nicole Boyce. Can you guys hear me? Excellent. Well, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much, Professor O'Rourke. Um, before I get started, I know that he already introduced me. So um, again, Nicole Boyce started Global Genes 10 years ago. Um, and in that time, we've had the good fortune of, of serving over 600 patient advocacy organizations globally. We work with about 80 biotech and pharma partners, um, and we've, like Jim mentioned, um, have touched 100, over 100,000 patient advocates globally in 26 countries. But the primary reason, or we did this because there was this urgent need that I personally saw with a dear friend of mine, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but today, I really wanna talk to you about a couple things. I wanna, 10 years hence was a big topic. When we were asked to share where the, what the world would look like in 10 years, I had a colleague of mine, we started conducting interviews with a bunch of uh, the leaders in the community on the science side, on the governance side, um, on the biotech sector side, on the patient advocacy side, on the data analytics side, to really try to fuel this conversation um, and share kind of where we've come, where, the, where this whole world has come from, where we're at today, that will kind of set the tone for the opportunities that we see over the next 10 years and well into the future. There's two themes that I want you to keep in mind as we're going through this, and it's really about technology and the impact that it's having on this community. And what's most important as a rare disease patient advocacy organization is the role of patients. The courageous, unstoppable, out of the box thinking patients that are driving the majority of this change. Before we get started though, I just wanna take a quick poll of the audience. So in this room, we, I think we have undergrads and graduate students. So, how many of you right now are undergrads in this? Yeah, okay, and then graduate students? And you're all in the business school, majority of you? Um, do we have anyone on the science side? Awesome. Do we have anyone on the clinical side? I think you have like a nursing program on the support side? No, medical side? Okay, business, innovation, entrepreneurship? Nice. Okay, um, as we walk through this presentation, I also want you guys to take your personal goals, what you're studying, and see how you can actually um, apply this to potentially uh, helping support 
this world of science and technology and advancement in rare disease. Um, how many of you in this room know someone affected by a rare disease? Interesting. Do you mind saying what the disease is? Do you know? Excellent. Anyone else? What type of disease? Huntington's. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, so some of the statistics um, that we'll get into um, are pretty shocking. And it's one of the drivers that actually caused me to leave my career to come and start this. Um, but before, I'll just go into a little bit more detail about the person who was my catalyst to totally create a pivot in my world and my life um, to try to help this community in rare disease. So this is my dear friend Kelly and her son Derek, born and raised in Laguna Beach, California. Derek was born with extra fingers and toes, bowed bones on one side. He had kind of a misshapen head. He wasn't progressing in the hospital. Um, they thought he was blind. He was having bouts of pneumonia and bronchitis. Mom and dad had no idea that this, what was happening. Um, he saw multiple specialists, and after six months and no answers, Derek was sent home with his mom and dad with no prognosis and no diagnosis. Can you imagine as a parent having absolutely no answers? So they went home and they started trying to uh, connect with other patient advocates, and they went to an early invention center. Um, and there they saw other patient advocates and moms and dads that had kids that had no diagnosis. But then they also started meeting others with these strange name conditions. And at that time, you know, as a friend, I start and being in this world of biotech, I started, you know, listening and hearing, and, and this notion of being undiagnosed was baffling to me. Here we live smack in the middle of some of the best healthcare in the world. How the heck do we not have any answers for this family? So it was mind blowing to me, and um, I saw this really powerful connection that was being made by all of these families, regardless of disease, regardless of diagnosis. When I started looking into this world of rare disease and saw some of the statistics that I'll share with you, I was totally blown away. And at that point, I realized that there was some work to do and that there might be a little, little tiny way that we could help make people's lives easier, help give them tools and resources that they need to go out there and really rock the world for their, the disease and the people that they care so much about. So, Derek, four years into his journey, actually, was diagnosed with an autosomal recessive genetic disorder called Joubert syndrome. He was born without part of his cerebellum. Here we are in Southern California. How the heck did we miss that? They tested him because they thought that he was potentially blind. How did we miss that? So all of these little, uh, you know, the more that we started learning, the more upset I got. And that was pretty much my catalyst to come and start Global Genes. So what I saw with this group and these families was lack of access to education, lack of access to resources. There's no treatments and cures. There's no cures. And at the time, there's no treatments for Joubert syndrome. So there was a ton of problems and a ton of challenges. And if we could do a little thing by connecting people, maybe giving them what they need to go out there and be drivers, maybe we could help game change this. So that was kind of the catalyst and the start to Global Genes. So really quickly on, on um, Derek's condition as well. So the parents found out at the time, because there was a genetic test, that they had a one in four chance of actually having another child with Joubert syndrome. And so they made a decision not to have any additional, any more kids. But the, that testing and for that disease is not, at the time, was not common, right? They were lucky that they had the ability to go out there and get tested um, to uncover what this disease was. So today we're talking and, and we I shared that we're going to kind of start with, you know, kind of where we've come from in rare disease and what's possible. Um, there's this incredible convergence happening right now in rare disease and in this world between science and technology. It's a pivotal time where this convergence is happening with patient advocates, with patient advocacy, with science, with technology. And it's going to provide an opportunity for us to really game change this world for rare disease. So um, we will move forward and talk about those three things, right? Um, 
where we're at today, where we've come from, where we're at today, and kind of the future in, uh, the future for in 10 years for rare disease and what's possible. So first to kind of start off, I, I want to tell you another little story about my friend Mark Dant and his son Ryan. So Ryan, at three years old, um, was diagnosed with um, a very rare condition called mucopolysaccharidosis. It's a lysosomal storage disease. And what a lysosomal storage disease is, is our cells um, have lysosomes that are like trash compactors. And so they eat up um, uh, waste that accumulates in our cells. And with lysosomal storage disorders like MPS, that breaks down, and therefore the cells get inundated with um, this waste, and the cells die. So most LSDs are neurodegenerative, um, and all of them are deadly. So Ryan, Ryan's dad, Mark, was the chief of police in Dallas. And after uh, his son was diagnosed, he, they kind of, they will say in their own mind that they spent a year, um, you know, in mourning. What are we going to do? All of our dreams um, for our young son, who at the time was already this baseball, like little baseball kid, um, have been crushed. What do we do? He's been diagnosed with this really rare condition. So Mark decided, you know, all I can do, like most patient advocates, is go out there and have a bake sale. They raised three hundred and seventy dollars, and um, heard that there was a patient summit, um, and went to that summit and was sitting there listening to a researcher talking about enzyme replacement therapy, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. New new technology, new science. He went up to the presenter and said, "Hey, listen, my son was just diagnosed with MPS. Is there a possibility that what you're pre uh, presenting could help my son?" And they said, "Well." The, in particular, this one, this, this approach might not, but I'm going to send you to my colleague at UCLA who's doing work in this area, and let's see. So that, that little ounce of hope is what drove Mark to reach out to the scientist and convince him to start doing research in MPS1. That researcher, so... So after that event, then he started having, uh, you know, different, he raised a million dollars, and he started funding the work at UCLA with Dr. Emil Kakis. At the time, um, their son's condition was progressing. You know, time is short. And it took um, several years, um, a lot of missteps for uh, them to bring uh, this promising therapy to, to, the, to um, the families. Um, Ryan was enrolled in clinical trials. There was some ups and downs, um, but at the end of the day, he, the treatment was working successfully in, in keeping him um, thriving and actu actually reversing some of the neurodegeneration that they had seen, so it was this miracle. A biotech company then came in and saw the promise of this, this, uh, this compound and um, decided to take it on and brought it forward. And today, there is a treatment that is keeping all of these kids alive uh, with MPS-1. So today, you know, when uh, the future for Ryan looked not so good, um, Ryan actually was able to attend college and in 2017 graduate from his uh, dream school, which is University of Louisville down the road, um, in sports management. So he's been able to stay involved in the sport that he loved in the way that he can. And um, it's lovely to see a technology and science like this be able to really game change um, the world for this family and others. Again, this was patient driven. Patients are really creating a lot of this forward momentum and, and change and drive. So really quick, just um, some more statistics on rare disease. So there's 7,000 identified diseases with more um, being uh, identified every single year. Um, the average time it takes to find a diagnosis is about eight years. Um, in that time, you've seen multiple specialists and you've had up to three misdiagnoses. Um, the majority of these are genetic in, in uh, are genetic in nature, and over 50% affect children. So today, where it stands, only 5% of those 7,000 diseases have a treatment, and there's zero cures. So there's a lot of opportunity, 
There's 100% um, of the 7,000 diseases that we can work on to find a cure. There's a lot of opportunity to make an impact in this community. When you look at the amount of people globally that have a rare disease, one in 10 Americans have a rare disease. So one in 10 of you in here may have a disease or you know someone that does. Um, it affects 350 million people worldwide, which would technically, if we put them all in one place, would be the third largest country um, on the planet. And rare disease collectively, or in aggregate, affects more people on this planet than all cancers and AIDS combined. So really, rare disease is not so rare. When you have a rare disease, the realities are it affects not only um, you know, you physically, but there's also huge and a huge economic impact on this community. There's also an emotional toll, as you can imagine. Um, most people experience major depression, et cetera. So um, the challenges right now in rare disease um, are significant. A lot of the diseases currently are poorly understood. When you go into a doctor's office, usually patients have no more about the disease than those, those clinicians. Um, and uh, there's, there's not a lot of um, roadmaps like there is with cancer and AIDS um, when you finally get a diagnosis, what that path looks like. So there's a lot of areas and opportunities for us to grow and learn and understand. So, so there were two major milestones that happened that have kind of catalyzed a lot of effort and a lot of focus um, in rare disease. So the first of those was the Orphan Drug Act back in 1983. And this was the first time that, that there was um, a definition of rare diseases, 200,000 or less. So if 200,000 people are, are affected or less with a rare disease, that's considered rare. That allowed for um, certain incentives that um, that were provided to um, biotech and pharma companies to start and focus on this disease. Because before, if you think about, if there's a disease that affects 500 people, there wasn't really a business model around this for patient or for biotech companies to actually work on the disease. So this was a huge, uh, uh, a huge event in rare disease that really helped kind of bring forward new focus, new energy, new money behind uh, the sector. Before the Orphan Drug Act um, happened, there was only 10, uh, 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 oh my God, therapies for uh, rare diseases. And that has changed drastically since the Orphan Drug Act. So you'll see over the last several years, since the Orphan Drug Act, there, there's been more investment, there's been more drugs. Um, and today we just got some new statistics from the FDA um, that there's currently, um, in development, 560 rare disease drugs and 770 that have been approved as of 2018. So you can see this acceleration that really happened because of, um, of this Orphan Drug Act. The majority of the um, therapies right now are in rare, rare cancers and rare diseases, and you can see that there's, there's just a ton of activity in rare disease right now. The second big milestone actually happened, um, which has game changed everything from treatment, care, and we'll talk about this, was the mapping of the human genome in 2000, uh, in 2000 by Francis Collins, who's now the head of the National Institutes of, uh, of, the National Institutes of Health. Um, that was another major milestone that you'll see throughout uh, the next part of the, the program has just had such an impact on this community. So what is evolving? So, so we kind of talked about like the realities of rare disease, what's happening um, around the globe, uh, the kind of, you know, those events that happen that have kind of really pushed forward efforts in rare disease. Um, and now we kind of want to talk about where things are at in these categories. What is causing some of the forward movement that we see today that will also help support a lot of the innovation and what we're gonna see happen in the next 10 years? So this is actually the patient journey for, for rare disease. And if you think about, many of you have probably you know, been diagnosed with something, had a cold, you know, I have high blood pressure. Um, you know, have I ever thought about being in a clinical trial? No. Have I ever connected with a, a foundation? No. How, have I ever been involved in anything related to research in hypertension? No, right? No, because there's millions of other people that can do that, so I just put it aside. 
But in rare disease, that's not the case. In rare disease, what happens is that patients are thrown into this world with this life-limiting, life-altering condition. And suddenly they are on a journey to find a diagnosis. They have to become the disease experts themselves. They have to start creating communities. They have to start learning about science, technology. How do we speak science speak? How do we build um, uh, nonprofits and companies to help support our community? We have to start looking and funding research. They never had to do that before. They have to seed fund and de-risk research down the, path, the road so that other investors can come in and really start investing and in, in moving that forward. They're working with the FDA, and with biotech and pharma companies in drug development. So patients now have become these drivers in all things related to the disease. They have to architect their, in their family's health, their community's health, and now they become partners and drivers in um, drug development. This is drastically different than what we've seen in the past. And this is, this is um, creating so much of that urgency and the change that we'll be talking about. From a diagnosis perspective, we talked about some of the statistics. Eight years and 10 specialists. How the heck is that possible now? Um, but there are technologies now that we'll be talking about that are really changing that paradigm. So here's an example. This is adorable Massimo. He's from Australia. Um, he was born in 2008, and at one, they real, his mom and dad knew something was going on and um, uh, decided to try to get him tested and find, um, figure out what was wrong. Um, they had an MRI of his brain. He was having neurodegeneration. Things were happening and, um, and couldn't figure out what was going on with Massimo. So at the time, their genetic whole genome sequencing was kind of coming onto the scene. And it was very expensive at the time. And Massimo's family decided, um, you know what? We're going to save $10,000 and we're going to go out there and get whole genome sequenced, right? That was one of the outputs or the outcomes from um, uh, you know, our ability to map the human genome. So they spent $10,000, and when they got back the results, they had 11,500 potential uh, problems or um, mutations that could be affecting little Massimo. There's no way they didn't have enough time to try to analyze all those. The technology wasn't there yet. They did find this amazing man, Ryan Taft, um, who was a, po <coughs> excuse me, a postdoc um, at the Institute for Molecular Biology in Queensland, and basically begged him and convinced him to kind of take a look. You're an analytics guy. Like, how, how can we figure this out? At the time, Ryan was affiliated with Illumina, um, which is based in San Diego. They're, um, they're kind of the backbone of a lot of the genetic testing and sequencing. They're like the intel inside. So, all the sequencers that all of these companies are using to create genetic tests and read them come from Illumina. So Ryan convinced Illumina to sequence the parents. So now we have the patient and we have the two parents. Now we can see if there's any, like what we talked about, if there's any markers or any, um, any uh, it's going to help them kind of narrow down the potential um, and look at, uh, and help narrow down those, those um, you know, the results that they got. Um, and it took 18 months, and they finally found that there was, it's called a DARS gene that was, was mutated and was causing the problems that um, little Massimo faced. So he was diagnosed with hypomyelination, I can't even say that, um, HBSL. It's deadly, um, and there wasn't a lot of time. Um, so the fact that they had this diagnosis, though, allowed them to start working on next steps, patient-driven. So they started working with some of the local um, universities to help define vectors that will allow for other tests to happen um, and start finding answers um, around this disease. So um, the process that this family went through to try to help find, uh, you know, um, help understand the underlying cause of, of Massimo's disease um, was long. I mean, it took almost a little over two years. Um, today, however, 
um, with the technology that we have right now with Illumina and others, it would take hours. So imagine 10 years from now, maybe what Massimo's journey would be like. So there's this notion of, um, and this discussion happening around genetic testing and whole genome sequencing, you know, if we can gather that information from parents and kids or parents um, and the affected, um, we'll be able to narrow down, diagnose, or narrow down, diagnose, and understand the underlying cause of a lot of these diseases much more quickly. So we'll be talking about some efforts that are taking place right now um, uh, that are helping try to solve that. So Illumina, if they would have, if the family would have had to pay for this, would have cost it would have cost them fifty thousand dollars to do what what they did. Um, today the whole genome sequence is $1,000, and Illumina has said that a whole genome sequencing in the very near future will only be $100. That can game change a lot of this time to diagnosis and will save a lot of kids' life if we can move, that, move this forward more quickly. So just a comparison, when the human genome, uh, when, th when we map the human genome, it cost $100 million to map the genome. Today, it costs $1,100 with whole genome sequencing in that short period of time. Um, and then you can see as, now this is, this is what we're gonna be starting to talk a lot about, that you know, the number now of, of sequences that are happening and the amount of data that we're collecting is vast. So what we're talking a lot about is that biology is now becoming a data science, which we've never really said before. So um, now that we have this technology, we're seeing rapid change in diagnosis and treatment in our understanding of these diseases. As the prices come down, we'll see a lot, um, a lot more of this data generated, but the hope is that we'll also um, you know, be able to diagnose patients more quickly and really understand um, their diseases and hopefully um, have the ability to develop in treatments, therapies, and cures much more quickly. So again, the theme now moving forward is really about data and technology and, and how it's driving a lot of the change that we're seeing. So since whole genome sequencing and our understanding of genetics has um, come into play in rare disease, you'll see that um, we've started identifying, I think, on average, of about 200 new diseases every single year. As we, as we identify new diseases, we're also able then to create vectors and actually create tests. So Derek, if, we, if they would have been able to sequence him or get a genetic test to him more quickly, probably wouldn't have had to wait four years. They could have done it while he was in the NICU when he was born. And that is a project that's actually happening at Rady Children's in San Diego. So Rady's was given a $2 million grant, and um, they're estimating that one in four of those kids that are in the NICU every day have an undiagnosed genetic disorder. So the idea was if we could test them right out the gate with rapid whole genome sequencing, would it shift how we treat those kids from a medical, like a treatment side, and could we save lives? Or could we save the progression of a disease in new ways? So the folks at Rady's um, have been, had started, have started working on this. And of the kids that they've tested in the NICU, 40% have had a, a significant pivot and shift in the treatment out the gate within the first seven days of their life that have had a benefit, had a beneficial effect on, uh, on, on their future. Um, and so this, I think, when we look 10 years ahead and we'll be talking about this, the notion of whole genome sequencing out the gate can be a game changer for people, um, kids and family members that are diagnosed or that don't have a diagnosis and that are looking for um, a diagnosis quickly. There's also some other new technologies out there that are super cool, and again, generating a massive amounts of data. But it's this dysmorphology technology. So they say that 44% of all rare diseases can actually be identified also through photographs. So our friends at FDNA have created this app 
um, and they keep generating new pictures and photos um, and are using AI to really try to help create another way to help shrink the time to diagnosis. So another tech um, advancement that's really helping change this whole diagnostic odyssey. Um, we have the good fortune of participating in a hackathon at MIT using this technology and it even nailed um, a kid, um, a student who was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. This technology somehow actually um, uh, diagnosed him with a mental health condition. So that was pretty remarkable. So when you think about the promise of this technology and whole genome sequencing, we have the ability to find new patients around the globe. We have the ability to, through spit testing, to whole genome sequence, and with this dysmorphology technology, to go out and really start supporting these patients wherever they may reside around the world. That's powerful, and that's game-changing. From a research perspective, again, patients are game-changing everything in rare disease. Here at Notre Dame, the beloved Era Parsigian had four grandkids, and three of them were diagnosed with a very deadly disease called Neiman Pixie. Um, and in 1994, I want to make sure I get all these statistics right. In 1994, they started their foundation. Because at that time, there was no understanding of Neiman Pick. They didn't know the cause. Um, and obviously there were no treatments. So the Persigium Foundation came together and, and they tried to recruit some researchers to come to engage them in, um, or try to convince them that Neiman Pixie was a great uh, place to invest their time. And at that time, they had two researchers come to their first conference. Since then, because of their tenacity and, again, because the patients know that time is short and um, we have to be chargers and drivers, um, they've raised over $45 million and they have 50 researchers now working in Neiman Pick. And there's actually several drug companies right now that are involved in um, bringing forth um, a, a treatment for Neiman Pick C and hopefully a cure. Um, the other interesting part of rare disease is that, and, and Francis Collins, who actually um, mapped the human genome, who's the head of the NIH, when he became, when he um, came on as the director of the NIH, he said something really profound. He said, we're going to flip our current model upside down. We're not going to focus all of our efforts on common diseases. Because what he believed is that focusing on rare diseases actually will help have a trickle-up effect and help inform a lot of these common diseases. So Neiman Pick C has been termed a childhood Alzheimer's. So when you think about the impact of that, they're doing a lot of this research on Neiman Pick C, but they're seeing all of these potential benefits to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. That's powerful. It also creates more incentives for biotech and pharma and researchers to get into the game of rare disease because there's, there's other opportunities um, and that their research, their research could affect larger patient sets. So we talked a lot about patients again. You know, patients as drivers, you know, they're moving from, uh, you know, bake sales and 5K runs um, and just donating samples to really driving, owning data, um, creating venture philanthropy. You know, they're, they're owning the process and they're not waiting. In fact, some are going out and starting their own companies. And so one of those is actually another um, uh, Notre Dame alum, John Crowley and his family. And there's a whole story that talks about John's journey as um, a biotech marketer to now a biotech entrepreneur and CEO, and the journey to help find a treatment for their kids 
um, disease called Pompe disease. Um, John has been an incredible leader and visionary in rare disease as a patient advocate. Um, and you can learn more about his story um, with, with the movie Extraordinary Measures that was actually, um, I think it came out about six years ago, um, that really chronicles kind of the classic um, path of these patient advocates that won't take no for an answer, you know, finding compounds, finding the researchers to drive it, raising the money, pushing it forward because time is of essence. Today, Megan and Patrick are doing well. Megan Crowley, you may see her driving around campus, um, will be graduating this year. She is a fourth year student here at Notre Dame. Um, and she's doing amazing. And what a gift the Crowley family is to rare disease um, and to their kids and to others with Pompe and other lysosomal storage diseases. So John's company is not only working on Pompe disease, but again, that whole category of rare diseases, uh, the lysosomal storage disorders. So again, patients taking initiative and going out there to game change. Another example is um, Scott Johnson at 20 was diagnosed with MS. He, was a, he had a career as an entrepreneur. So when you think about a lot of the stuff that you guys are learning about, entre about entrepreneurs, right? You have to collaborate. You have to be, take risks. You have to passionately um, problem solve um, in unique ways. You have to think outside the box. And what he realized was um, the current system for uh, drug discovery and research was broken. How in rare disease... Can you, can you pursue something rare and have all of your work done in silos? He also saw that it took far too long and way too much money to develop a drug, and it would take even longer for rare disease. So he knew that we had to change that. So he brought his um, entrepreneurial mindset to the table to look at how could we create a collaborative research model that's going to help accelerate research in the disease that I care about for himself. And so he built a way to um, incent the researchers to work together, to collaborate, to get paid, so that they together can move this forward. So across the board, not only from the research side, fostering this collaboration, but also data gathering, data sharing, et cetera. You can see from soup to nuts, from the lab, from the bench to the bedside, um, there's collaboration that needs to happen. So he saw an opportunity to change. And this is a new model that a lot of um, patient advocates are, are working for. They are becoming the drivers and the owners of this process. They're building out the, the process and the incentives to get all of these people talking and working together. It's the only way that we're going to get stuff done in rare disease. Ono Farber, an amazing kid who was diagnosed with NF1, neurofibromatosis. It's an overproduction of a lot of tumors that, um, that impact your entire body. He's a tech entrepreneur out of the Bay Area. And when he was diagnosed, he realized that his time, you know, could be short. And there were no drugs right now um, in existence that could help him. Um, so what he did was he hosted a hackathon. As an owner of all of his medical data, he opened it up to the world. And he wanted kids, other kids, at this hackathon to map his data to existing drugs that were already FDA approved to try to find something that might help him today. That's thinking outside the box. And it's something that no one else had ever done before. As a result of that, he realized how important all of the medical data from his electronic health records were. And he, it actually was a catalyst for him to then build a company called RDMD, which actually co collects all of your data as a patient, all the electronic health records, all the notes from physicians, and puts them into one place so that then they can be analyzed and used later on to help accelerate treatment, to help accelerate um, future drugs and therapies, um, the ability for individuals to participate in clinical trials in new ways. So this is huge. Again, patients coming to the table, creating change with technology and, the, and genomics. 
There's also new models for data sharing. Um, Nebula Genomics and Luna, Luna DNA were literally launched last year. So this is all happening in real time. There's the new organ and a chip technology that um, with 3D printing that's also allowing this technology is providing ways to um, help attack or address some of the challenges with these diseases um, in new ways. Um, artificial intelligence and AI, a computer, a, a chemical engineer started a company in Salt Lake City that is literally using AI in high up throughput screening to test what, what Ono Farber was doing, looking proactively at all these different diseases and what drugs currently exist and where we might be able to find matches to help accelerate treatment development for a lot of these rare diseases. Remote monitoring. So this is Ellie. Um, she was able to participate in a clinical trial remotely because of the new technology. We haven't had the ability to do that before. So we can have patients become active participants also in new ways, right, around research, um, not having to, to go all around the country. There are new models in advocacy. These are three examples. Everyone heard about cystic fibrosis. Um, they invested in research that was then um, sold, and the, the organization Cystic Fibrosis benefited um, from the sale of um, CaliDeco, Cali sorry, um, for $3.3 billion. That's helping them continue to fund new research. CHDI partnered with an organization in San Diego, invested in some early stage research that then got bought by Roche for $392 million. The world's changing, and again, patients and technology are really drivers of this. So back to the data science uh, discussion that we had before. Biology and biological research is turning into data science, right? So for all of you data geeks in here, this, there's a huge opportunity to make a huge difference um, for patients, not only affected by rare disease, but in the healthcare sector period. Clinical trials, where are things right now and where are they headed? Again, with precision medicine, we're able to run a clinical trial with one individual. We've been able to customize a potential therapy for one individual to help them, um, to, to possibly help them and cure them. Orphan drugs, um, the FDA has approved smaller clinical trials. That's going to help accelerate and speed up therapy development and cut costs. Um, faster approvals. Um, faster uh, uh, cut costs, faster approvals, um, and then we can move forward a lot of these treatments and therapies and cures much faster. And then within all of this, there's also recently been um, uh, legislation that was passed around compassionate use. So a lot of times you'll see a drug out there that has a potential of impact on your disease. Um, you've tried other things and nothing's working. And even though it's not approved, this legislation for experimental therapies will allow a patient um, to actually access that. So that was a huge breakthrough this past year. So again, you can see a lot of this is happening right now today. Treatment. What needs to happen in rare disease or comprehensive care centers? It's different. Patients have to see like 10 specialists. How can you go to all those appointments in all different places? So a lot of, um, on the care side, uh, organizations and, and, um, and institutes are working to create these comprehensive care centers that are allowing a patient to come once and see regularly all these different patients, right? Creating um, a center of excellence that provides um, real expertise for these particular diseases or categories of disease. Telehealth. Again, another technology that's changing the paradigm for patients and care. Um, how nice, again, to be able to be a participant um, in the comfort of your home. There's other technologies. Intel has a, a spin out called Care Innovations that are creating sensors for homes that are allowing or are um, uh, providing the opportunity for patients to be involved in clinical trials or just monitor their disease 
um, throughout the day, right? So it's constantly generating data um, around how that patient's brushing their teeth, wh what time do they eat, et cetera. Um, so again, technology really, really driving a lot of this change. Um, therapeutics, again, this, this move towards precision medicine. Um, you may remember Obama launched a precision medicine initiative that's really focusing and supporting on kind of this reality that in order to help, you know, as with genetics and genomics, we are able to narrow down um, or look deeper at each of these diseases and find unique nuances um, within the disease, even if it's a, considered a common disease. So for example, um, Gibert syndrome that we talked about, my friend's um, son's disease, at the time it was considered one condition. Now there's 20 separate mutations that they've identified within that disease category. So our knowledge, um, we're able to um, glean so much more depth um, and understanding of, of these diseases. Um, also, as a result of genetic testing um, and, and the genetics and what we know about the conditions, there's new types of therapies coming forward. We talked earlier about enzyme replacement th therapy. That's exactly what it is. It's not a, it's not a Band-Aid. It's not, um, you know, a chemical drug. This is, some, this is a biologic that literally replaces um, the enzyme that is mutated. Um, so you'll see this with regenerative medicine, stem cell therapy. Um, there's technologies that we'll talk about, I think right here, um, gene editing and CRISPR um, that are lit literally allowing us to go into um, your DNA and cut out the mutated part of the DNA and replace it with um, the healthy DNA. Yes, there are potential um, bioethics uh, questions and things that we have to consider, but the technology is there to really game change the world for those that are affected with these debilitating and deadly conditions. Scott Gottlieb, who's now the commissioner and heads the FDA, um, said it like remarkably, um, the concepts and everything that we've been talking about are no longer the stuff of science fiction, but rather real life science, where cells and tissues can be engineered to grow, healthy functional organs to replace disease ones, where new genes can be introduced into the body to combat disease, gene therapy, and where adult stem cells can generate replacements for cells that are lost to injury or illness. It's pretty remarkable. Technology is also playing a role in helping patients live and thrive. Again, um, this uh, eSight, the glasses, took David's eyesight from 2,500 to 2,030. Devices um, are allowing people to this exoskeleton paralyzed to walk again. So, some questions to ponder. We're almost done. Um, so what's possible? What are the biggest challenges? And what do we need to do to ensure the brightest future for this community? Um, there's a lot that's possible. It's a crazy time right now in rare disease. Um, we have the technology now to actually treat people in the womb. Are we gonna do it? Those are some big questions. So will we see that come to fruition? Can we and will we cure all of these kids? by the time they're born. Something for you to ponder. In the next 10 years, what we hope and what we think can happen is we can end the diagnostic odyssey, that we can have treatments for thousands of diseases, not a few hundred, um, that we can actually bring forward cures. So when we talk about CRISPR technology and we talk about gene editing, those are curative for the first time. Yes. <laughs> So the real reality, however, is the technology and the science and the ability is there to expand treatments. This innovation is driving so much change and potential cures for this community. But the reality is that there's some threats to this advancement. So it's not cheap to do all this. Innovation isn't cheap. Getting there is not 
and it, uh, is not inexpensive. So the cost to, to develop drugs have been in the billions of dollars. You know, how can we shrink that? Um, access to treatment, I'm sure all of you guys have heard on the news, I mean, it's been all over. The, the crazy costs of, of, um, of these therapies, you know, a million dollar drug. But when you think about it and what our world, what our industry is looking at is, what if we can cure someone of their disease at birth through CRISPR or gene editing? We have to look at health economics and look forward to say, well, what, how have we eased the burden on the healthcare system if that patient then would spend you know, thousands of days and years in hospitals and seeing specialists and having um, you know, recurring issues and hospital stays? So is that $1 million to cure and allow someone to live you know, a fruitful life and be a contributor to society worth it? So these are the questions that we're pondering and we're trying to help um, build health, and health economic models that will support that. So imagining the future. I'm not gonna focus on the challenges because I wanna stay positive. We will end the diagnostic odyssey for most people with monogenic diseases. Um, and we will have that big question ahead of us is, you know, as to can we and should we um, you know, be able to help diagnose and treat people at birth. For research, we need to expand our knowledge of these diseases. We can do so now with all of this data that we're gathering. Data is going to accelerate not only treatment or diagnosis, it's going to accelerate um, the ability to um, effectively treat patients and also develop drugs and therapies that are potentially curative. The technologies like the 3D printing and the organ on a chip is gonna help us um, really uh, look at clinical trials in a different way. We won't have to rely so much on patients to be part of some of these clinical trials. This will also, also cut costs and help accelerate um, the drug development cycle. Again, technology replacing the need for animal models. Um, and with all of this, we see the potential um, you know, cost for all of this to decrease. At least that's the hope. For clinical trials, again, um, there's new models. We have new ways to engage patients. Um, there's, we're hopeful that we can build kind of this repository of universal vectors so that, that it can help us better understand all of these 7,000 uh, 7, plus rare diseases. Um, we want to move away from the clinical trials where you have to go and sit and you have to send patients everywhere and have them spend weeks at a time being participants. We want to bring the trials to them so that we can make it easier for them to participate. It will also cut costs. Um, again, cutting costs. That We keep talking about cutting costs, but we do believe that technology is going to allow for that to happen. In 10 years, it won't be so limiting um, and so, so contentious as it is today. Um, and um, what we hope happens, and this is critical too, is that patients um, will be playing a larger role even in clinical trial design. So for example, um, right now, you'll have a biotech company that will move forward with a clinical trial and have one of the endpoints being, oh, we want um, the kids, the, the big marker is that they walk for six minutes. Um, when in fact that disease community cares more about being able to lift their hand to feed themselves, right? We don't care so much about walking. There's opportunity. Yes, that's important, but what's more important is, is this ability to um, be more independent. So patients, what we hope we will see is their involvement in more involved in the clinical trial designs. From treatment perspective, um, you know, uh, we're involved with an organization called the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, and with every, all the um, um, activity that's being done, that we expect to have over a thousand new treatments um, in the next 10 years for rare diseases, um, which will be remarkable. Um, we'll develop more targeted approaches um, to better understand um, kind of uh, what's ca causative about these conditions. 
Uh, we will have um, functional cures, again, with gene therapy, with CRISPR, with gene medicine. There's an opportunity to use this technology to completely transform um, our treatment for um, these kids and those affected by rare disease. Um, and then the technology um, that continues to advance is going to allow us to, um, from a health tech perspective, um, create new ways for um, patients um, with disabilities to thrive and prosper and flourish. From a clinical treatment perspective, um, we want to be able to diagnose at birth. So the diagnostic odyssey, odyssey should not happen. We have the technology to change that. So that will require system change within the healthcare sector. But if we can, like with what's happening at Radies, showcase the importance of of outcomes and treatment outcomes by, you know, having an understanding of these diseases out the gate, we can game change the world for these families. The centers of excellence will continue to pop up. In fact, yesterday there was a new announcement um, between Cleveland Clinic, the Harrington Discovery Trust, who's been on campus here quite a few times, um, and the University of Oxford, um, who are working on 350 rare diseases, and they're creating a global center of excellence um, to help support a lot of the unmet needs in rare disease. So again, collaboration. Um, collaboration between um, research institutions, academia, and patient advocacy orgs. And then telehealth, um, no more, uh, we don't. We will have the ability to treat people across borders um, and across state lines um, you know, in ways that we haven't before. I'm gonna give you just another quick story. Um, I met with the women um, who are running the um, rare disease efforts in the Ukraine. And when we were talking about pain points, and what keeps them up at night? They said a couple things. They said, first, our, um, our country is at war um, with the Russian Federation. Our government changes over every single year. To date, we have zero access to genetic testing. We only know of 250 of the 7,000 plus rare diseases, and we only have access to 18 medications. So things like this, you know, access to telehealth. How are they going to get those patients in the Ukraine to see experts wherever they may reside? Like, this is a huge need in rare disease when you have patient populations of 100 people worldwide. So a lot of these technologies are going to, are going to allow us to really transform that care in ways that we've never, ever seen before. So a couple of the takeaways um, really is technology and patients, um, there's a convergence, but the technology and, and the, these rock star patients are really driving so much of this change in rare disease. Um, they create a sense of urgency that we didn't have before. In the olden days, people researched to research. Now you're, now you're looking into underlying causes of conditions to create treatments, therapies, and cures, and better understanding of rare disease. So there's a sense of urgency. The timelines are shrinking, and it's patient-driven. Patients do not accept the status quo. If someone at a hospital says, well, that's just how we do it, then they say, forget that. We're changing that. That's not acceptable. My kid's dying. So they're, they're not accepting of the status quo, and they're getting people to think differently. Patient advocates will always tell you, if someone says no, like Mark Dant, the family that we talked about, or Massimo's family, or John Crowley's family, when people say no or we can't, they say, oh, no, we can, and we're going to figure that out. We're going to problem solve it. We're bringing fresh perspective. We're bringing urgency. We're bringing a passion that hadn't existed before. And the other big thing, and I know I had the good fortune of meeting with your dean earlier today, you know, he talked a lot about one of the core principles here in the business school is about collaboration. In rare disease, absolutely essential. You see collaborations happening between patients and researchers, patients and invest, investment firms. You have um, researchers uh, with clinicians. You have um, all sorts of combinations, but you have to have that collaboration in order to really move the needle forward in rare disease. It's essential. 
So again, now when you look back at this kind of continuum for rare disease patients, you can see the importance and criticalness of their involvement as drivers, right? They're critical. And they're utilizing the technology and the science and this um, convergence to really help um, uh, move the needle forward for all the things that they care about for their disease and in rare disease. So for you guys in the room, um, and I'm sorry I have to stand so close because my eyes are so bad that I have to keep reading. <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess my, my takeaway for you all is be like these patients. Be tenacious. You're entering a, the workforce in a time of like, incredible innovation. It's almost like there's no rules. There's all this convergence happening. Science and tech are creating just limitless opportunities to do good. Today, also, it's not okay to, be, to, to pursue things um, within the guardrails, right? There were the, the community in the world is encouraging you to think outside the box, to do things different, to, to change perspectives. Like, you can do this. And it's so cool to me that you guys are at that period in your lifetime that you can go out there and, and really make a difference. Like patients, don't accept the status quo. Push back. Again, set high expectations not only for yourselves, but whatever the heck, wherever you end up. Don't accept the status quo. And if something's not possible, problem solve it. Think outside the box. Bring new ideas and new concepts. Try things. Risk take. Because you can change the world. A very, a very... Um, well-loved person who was like the godfather of biotech and rare disease made a statement that was so true and he said this to an audience of patients and researchers and companies and he said you know there's not often that you can you can really change the world he's like and in rare disease it's really hard but the most amazing thing about it is that when you do step into rare disease and you do start moving forward, you're providing so much hope for people and you're providing an opportunity to really truly change, change the outcomes and their hope, right? You can do it, it's hard, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be a rough journey, but once you're committed to it, and you stay with it, you're bringing so much hope to, to a, a community that hasn't had much. And last but not least is be collaborative. That was clear in the discussion this morning. I think it's clear here, but not just in rare disease, not just in science and tech, but like collaboration is key. And it wasn't really part of the formula for our generation, but you guys are at a different time, right? You're mission driven. You can do good, you can do well by doing good. But a lot of that is think about, don't stay in your lane, be collaborative and see who you can bring in to help really move these efforts forward. So my hope for you today also, so please use that hashtag care about rare, um, is you know, maybe that there was a little seed of inspiration in all the different ways that you guys can help this amazing community. Um, in whatever discipline you decide, there's opportunities to make a difference here. So whether you're research, science, tech, um, engineering in, on the investor side, finance side, biz, marcom, whatever it is, there's an opportunity here for you guys to be involved and really help usher forward um, game-changing science and um, support and treatment and care for um, all these amazing millions of families around the world. So from Global Genes um, and myself, thank you guys so much. Um, please note that if you have friends or family or anyone affected by rare disease, please send them our way. We'd love to help them. I mean, the important message today, really, um, on, from a Global Genes perspective is that, is that we're here. Um, sometimes this is overwhelming and heavy. Um, but these families aren't alone. You're not alone. And what, regardless of your age, whether you're a patient or parent, we have a way to connect you to others um, or your, the people that you love to others to build that sense of community support.
love so send them to global genes so with that thank you peace Hi, so um, you had mentioned that uh, researchers have a hard time discovering patients, and conversely, I'm sure patients have a hard time finding researchers. Uh, do you know if there's any sort of uh, platform out there that actually helps you know, the one side to find the other, uh, something that's hip HIPAA protected, but uh, kind of helps to build that body of patients that uh, hopefully can uh, help to, you know, those researchers that are looking for a project to, uh, you know, find that good uh, project with potential for advancement? Yeah. Um, so there's an organization called the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, um, and it's made up of about 500, I think Notre Dame is actually part of it, um, the College of Science, but um, uh, has kind of created this um, place to go. Um, where not from a patient-driven perspective, but a researcher perspective to look across this kind of database of work that's being done um, to see who's doing what. It's not for patients, but Chan Zuckerberg, um, so uh, Facebook, um, Mark Zuckerberg and his wife um, built the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and we were just at a conference two weeks ago where they said that they kind of want to help tackle that exact problem that you're that you're thinking about, right? So how from a patient-driven side can we make it easier for them to connect with um, researchers? Global Genes does that in a super archaic way. Um, you know, we get people calling us every single week and we have genetic counselors on staff um, that help just from kind of like our knowledge um, to kind of help connect patients. In fact, we had a patient, um, uh, so for example, we at one of our conferences, we had a patient that had started funding some research and sat next to someone from Pfizer. They started talking about it, um, about the research. He put that person in touch with their BD and I mean, it doesn't always happen that easy, but kind of ushered that forward. Um, we have a new portal that where what we're trying to do is help um, create those connections, but I would say there isn't like an app for that right now, like a super easy way for patients to go out there and, um, and uh, find that, but I think that there's, there's stuff right now that's being developed, but that doesn't mean that you can't develop that. Hi, thank you for coming to speak with us today. Um, you touched briefly um, about some incentive and compensation structures and how changing those kind of helped, um, whether it be physicians, researchers, or just other stakeholders work together to come to a solution. Um, can you touch briefly on maybe some of those structures that you've seen work or how, how they've changed? So were you talking about like the multiple myeloma or the orphan drug act, like for biotech or the um, the multiple myeloma example? Yes. Okay. So, um, well, one was actually around Neiman Pixie. So there was a patient um, that brought in kind of a general contractor PhD, right, researcher. That sole responsibility was to go out and identify kind of leading researchers, and there were six in Neiman Pixie. They built a structure that created weekly touch points, weekly sharing of data. They each had identified a certain stream that they were going to be focusing on. And they got paid by, um, with milestone payments once these, um, these milestones were met. So meeting weekly, sharing the data, right? And, and so there was one person who, uh, there wasn't a conflict, right? So he, the, the PhD that was in charge of this kind of project managing this um, was the one that was kind of keeping track and, and ensuring that this collaboration happened. To, to move this forward. And where they are right now is um, actually with that program, the SOAR program for Neiman Pick is, um, it, it then the SOAR project was kind of like the early kind of investment in this research that then got brought to the NIH and now is being moved forward um, through the NIH. So um, 
they don't have a treatment on the market yet, but so it was that kind of an example or yeah, I mean 30,000 foot, but I'm happy to put you in touch if you are interested um, in with some of the folks that are actually managing this collaborative research networks. There's another um, person, David Fagenbaum, um, out of UPenn, who actually is a rare disease patient himself with Castleman's disease, and he's built a whole structure and is bringing forward technology, like software technology that's gonna allow for a lot of this um, collaboration to happen more seamlessly and efficiently. Hi. Um, you touched upon what was going on, I guess, more in the NICUs now with um, having the testing. Is insurance company paying for that? Are doctors advocating for it? Um, if a parent says, I want that done, and the doctor fights it, can they just pay out of pocket for it? Like, how can that? Because it seems like that's such a simple way mm -hmm. it's to totally identify simple. a problem. It's so simple, right. but our healthcare system is really messed up right now. So to answer your question, it's not widely, that's not um, a program that's widely adopted yet. This is um, uh, kind of the start. So at Rady Children's, again, they were, so the patients aren't paying for anything. So as part of, if, if any child is brought into the NICU within seven days, they're gonna rapid whole genome sequence them. It's all paid for by the hospital through this grant to try to find uh, you know, the underlying cause of why they're in the NICU. Out of this is they're showcasing not only um, can we help diagnose patients more quickly, but also the big thing that we talked about was that shift in treatment Right, so you might be going down one path giving vitamins and all sorts of stuff and then realize, oh my gosh, like that was totally wrong for that disease. So there's been, what they're showing, I think I said it was over 40% of those um, uh, that were sequenced and, and a diagnosis happened, there was a shift in treatment that was significant in how it would impact the future health um, of, of that child. So. There will be uh, health outcomes um, that come that comes out of this uh, grant, and hopefully, this is something that you know can be adopted across the board. So, um, it's frustrating. I mean, today we get calls every single week. I there's there's adults and kids that um, that suddenly um, have something going on that's wrong, and even if you have the financial means to go out and get. Um, whole genome sequencing, like doctors won't write for it. Oh, you don't need it, you know, or I don't, you know, and it's frustrating. So we are trying to change that. So the last thing I'll say is we have kind of a moonshot that we're working on. Um, it's called Rare X, like SpaceX. Everyone remember that name. Um, and the whole point is to remove obstacles in a couple of ways. So first is remove obstacles to genetic testing wherever you are in the world. So everyone should be able to get whole genome sequencing. The second then is now where do we park all that information? So as a patient, you get whole genome sequenced in your whole family, now where do you put that? Where does your community put that? So we wanna build out um, a universal registry so that allows for all this data to be owned by patients but plugged into a place that's best in class. Then that data gets plugged into this Uber data repository that's open so that researchers from around the world can come and look across these diseases, right, and start finding um, commonalities between these diseases, underlying causes, and all this data, the, the big difference is this is patient-driven data versus investigator-driven data that has a tendency to hold on to that information and not share. So what we're seeing in the trends are, as patients, you own it, you can share it with whoever the heck you want, right, as you should, and let's put it up into this uber universal data repository that's open so that we can start game changing the world. So this, this project is being worked on right now with multiple partners, um, including the Broad Institute um, at Harvard, MIT, um, multiple patient organizations, um, other organizations, biotech companies. Um, it's a nonprofit effort, but again, you know, the idea was how can we truly game change the world? Imagine, this idea for our friends in the Ukraine, right? We now give them a place to get access to testing for whoever the heck needs it. 
we give them a regional, an opportunity to have a regional registry that gets plugged in now to this universal data repository and suddenly those people are counted and they can be supported. We don't know where they are right now, right? So, so there is so much is happening right now. In 10 years, this whole landscape is gonna look so different. So there's a lot happening, but again, I mean, the, the point too is we all have an opportunity to really make a change um, and to be part of this change. And so um, I encourage everyone to you know, continue thinking about that. If you have any other questions too, please let me know, I'm happy to. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Of the students, faculty, and thank staff you. at the Mendoza College of Business, thank you for flying all the way out here <laughs> from sunny California. And thank you for being part of 10 thank Years you. Hands. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>